Good morning and welcome to worship today with Grosio Presbyterian Church. I'm Philip Reed, pastor of this intelligent and innovative congregation. Today we are not live streaming as we have been doing in recent weeks. We're having a special service here on site today. We call it GIPC Talk. It's unique and different. It follows the model of our God Talk Unlimited. When we invite people to tell stories, in church we invite people to tell stories, their personal stories about their faith and adventures with God. It's a unique worship service. We don't have a sermon and uh, some of the other elements that are in our traditional service. Instead, this is a service in which we practice this ideal. There's something sacred in listening. Something sacred in listening to the witness of other people, to the testimony of other people. In effect, we are listening for God's word. It'll come to us in this service through the scriptures and through the lives of the people who have stories to tell. We are not live streaming our service today. We like to protect the anonymity of people, so we're not broadcasting them today through our, our service. Instead, we have some stories to tell you that come from other venues and other times. Think of this service today as something of a podcast in which you're listening to several people who have great things to say. And in the midst of it, let us worship God. We are also singing happy birthday today to someone who connects with our church mainly online, mainly through this service. So to you, Jane Heaton, special friend of Doug and Carol Scott, you, we want to sing happy birthday to you for your 90th birthday. That means you qualify for me to sing you a song on behalf of the congregation of Grosio Presbyterian Church. So Jane, here it goes. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, dear Jane, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Jane. Friends, on this day, let us gather together as one congregation and worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hey everybody, just wanted to take a moment to uh, give you a little bit more information about how this morning will go. Um, it's going to be different from our usual Sunday morning services, but uh, our hope is that you still feel the Holy Spirit moving, uh, that you're still able to connect to God. And our real hope is that with uh, this format, that you're able to connect uh, with other people, with their stories and maybe with each other um, a little bit more. So we're excited to, uh, to give it a try. So today is GIPC Talk, which is modeled after God Talk on Unfiltered. God Talk Unfiltered is a group that started meeting back in 2017, so a while ago. And what the team does is we go to places, we pop up in places and tell stories. Um, so we pop up in a different location uh, each time. Uh, we've been in bars, restaurants, um, an art gallery, a hair salon, um, coffee shops, wherever and we share stories and listen to other people's stories. And we just love it. These are God stories that, that we're listening to and that we're sharing. And everyone has God stories. Um, moments when we really feel the presence of God, uh, moments when we're frustrated with God, moments when uh, we don't know what to think about God. Um, and at God Talk Unfiltered, we really want to hear from people of all different sorts of faiths, um, people of no faith, uh, to speak about God, the divine, Allah, uh, a higher power, or no power at all, nor high, no higher power at all. Just want to hear from different people about their experiences. We hear amazing stories every time that we have these events. It, it touches us every single time. It's uh, just so wonderful. And so today you're going to be hearing stories from our previous events. 
Uh, these people have given us permission to share their stories. Not everyone who shares their stories uh, wants it broadcast uh, out there, but these people have been kind enough to let us share their stories so that uh, we can continue to hear them because they are really such wonderful, wonderful stories. And one thing that we say in God Talk Unfiltered over and over again is that speaking is brave, but listening is sacred. And we really believe that. And so today we are going to spend our worship service listening, listening to stories, listening to one another, and hopefully listening to the Holy Spirit, listening to what, uh, what God might be saying to us in our hearts. But before we get into all of that, Let's take a moment to center ourselves and to focus on God, who invites us into God's story each and every day. morning. As we prepare to worship today through storytelling and testimony, I think it's a good time to remind ourselves that storytelling is biblical. Our faith story is told by thousands of smaller stories throughout the Old and New Testament. Stories like Adam and Eve, Moses, Noah, and in the New Testament Jesus used stories and parables to teach people about the kingdom of God and to create disciples and deepen their faith. I'd like to think that if Jesus were with us today in this worship service, he'd be very comfortable telling stories and listening as we tell stories to each other. So with that in mind, we turn to scripture. We're in Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. Listen for God's word to you. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat, 
and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. And other seeds fell on good soil, and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen, for this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our first story today comes from a man named John, who actually attended our very first God Talk Unfiltered event. Let's listen to John's story. All right, good evening. I'm uh, John. I'm uh, from the area, uh, born and raised right around the corner. I uh, went to school right around the corner, went to church right around the corner. Uh, thankful to my mom and dad that uh, they raised me in the church, so I had a good foundation. I uh, went to church a little bit less frequently when I was in college. I uh, went to Wayne State right up the street, um, but then I joined the Navy after I went to college. And uh, 22, 23-year-old John is, uh, is on his first deployment. I went overseas. I was uh, stationed on a ship in a, uh, in a Muslim country in the desert. And uh, it's the first time I've been away from home, away from family, away from everybody I knew. Uh, and after a few weeks, maybe four or six weeks, I started to struggle out there. And uh, looked to the church. There was a chapel on base, but it was on the other side of base. And uh, I had to go through customs, go through, and it took an hour, an hour and a half to get there. And I could never get off the ship for that long. So I uh, was struggling quite a bit. And uh, was in my in my rack at lunchtime one day, and uh, heard on the one MC the ship speaker system uh, came across. He said, uh, "Good morning, USS Gladiator. This is Chaplain Jones, visiting chaplain from Task Force Five Three or whatever it was." He said, "And I'm holding a Sunday church service on the pier. Uh, there's a there's a trailer on the pier. All are welcome. God bless you. Have a good Sunday." And uh, I think there were eight ships on the pier at that time, so I'm out there. He went to every ship. I saw him go to every ship, so about 800 men he gave that invitation to. So I was excited. So I went over to the trailer, and I was the only one to show up besides the chaplain. And I felt uh, incredibly alone, like even more alone than I had felt an hour before. And uh, so he introduced himself to me, and we sang a couple of songs. He talked about what he had prepared that day, and uh, then we prayed. And I was feeling really down, and I said, "Chaps, is this is this normal?" I said, "You know, we're out here. Is it, you know, I know religion isn't necessarily popular among men. These are all male crews. Um, I can't really talk about it on board, but I didn't think I'd be the only one out of 800." And he said, "Brother, it it comes and goes. It ebbs and flows." He said, "I've I've been on board an amphibious assault ship, and when we were headed over to the Middle East, I had 3,000 Marines on board, and..." I was a ghost, and then when we were on the way back from the Middle East, my door was always open shut, open shut, everybody wanted to talk to Chaplin. So, you know, it comes and goes. And he said, but you know what? He said, I'm, uh, I'm stationed here now. He said, I got my family with me. He said, why don't you come to a uh, Bible study on Wednesday night? So he came, picked me up from the pier. Didn't really have transportation. It was difficult to get around. And uh, took me to his house or somebody's house. It, it moved around every week and introduced me to a group of people. Um, it was a bunch of families, which was good for me because I was feeling without family over there. And, uh, and really, it did a lot of good for me. But I'll never forget that uh, while we were in the trailer that day, and I asked him that, he said, he said, brother, I don't know if you noticed, but you're in the desert. He said, and when you're in the desert, you can do one of two things. He said, you're going to shrivel up with your spiritual faith, or you can grow deeper roots and thrive. So uh, I took that to heart, and I grew deeper roots out there. And I'm sharing this just in case uh, anybody in this room feels like they might be in a desert. 
I can promise you Wyandotte is not a desert, but you're not in the desert. Reach out to anybody in this room, anybody in any church, and you will thrive. Haven't we all felt that we're in the desert sometimes? I love that story. That's why we chose it. <laughs> um, so thank you to John for sharing his story. Our next story comes from Lisa, who is going to share a little bit about how she first came to believe in God. Hi, my name is Lisa, and I want to tell the story of how I came to know God. When I was in third grade, we had a, um, a snow day. And my brother and sister were younger. My mom had to go run errands or work or something, and my dad had to go to work. So my mom called my aunt and asked if she would babysit us. And she was Christian. My family wasn't Christian, but my aunt was Christian, so she had been praying to God that she would get to share her faith that day. So we were chosen <laughs> that day. We went to see her, she started to tell us about God and Jesus, and she wanted us to know Jesus and ask him into our heart. So she asked my brother and I, because my sister had already done this before, she went to Sunday school and asked Jesus in her heart. So she asked me if I want to do that. And I knew the right answer was to say yes. <laughs> So I asked Jesus in my heart. Um, I didn't believe in God. I really didn't believe. I, I was young, so I don't even know why I had this strong of an opinion, but I remember her saying the prayer, you know, forgive me my sins, Jesus, please come in my heart. And I remember thinking inside myself, no, I, that's so weird. I don't want to talk to myself. I don't understand. So I went home feeling really weird about it, like, I can't believe I would like say that and not really believe, but I didn't want to have a fight with her. I don't know what happened, but so that's when I received the Lord. But then I remember from that moment, so something did change even though I didn't believe. I grew up and people say, I noticed that people talk about God a lot. They say, I'm praying for you. God bless you. Why would God let this happen? And every time those people said something about God, this inner um, argument would happen where it was like, you don't believe in me, remember? And I'm like, yeah, I know, I don't believe. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, like, go on. And as I got older, it did get more uncomfortable for me to like have this dialogue. Like, why do I talk to someone that's not real? I don't know, that's weird. So when I was maybe 16 or 17, I could drive, and I started to feel I should visit my aunt more because I don't see her a lot. I don't know, my mom and her weren't like super close. She lived very close to us, but I didn't see her a lot growing up. So I just started thinking, I'm going to go visit her. I played clarinet, and she was a musician, so I always wanted to go and just play music with her. So we played music. I started to watch her. She was never alone. It was the strangest thing. I always thought her so peaceful. She looked so beautiful to me because she always had this presence with her. My uncle had to work. Uh, he would travel for work. So he, she lived alone a lot. But she just loved it. It was like she always had a best friend with her. And I could, I always thought, like, wow, that's, and she was talking Jesus, praise the Lord all the time. So I, to me, I saw her that she believed God was with her all the time. But she really was peaceful. She never worried about if her friends don't call her, if she's bored. She's never bored. She's always talking to God. And I don't know, it was, it was interesting to watch her. So one day they invited me to um, have dinner with them, my aunt and uncle. And I just, like, was drilling them, like, tell me about God. Tell me Jesus. Tell me heaven, hell. I want to know all these answers. I asked so many questions. And my aunt, I remember her stopping me. Lisa, you said this prayer. Don't worry. You already have Jesus. And then that voice, like, you don't believe in me, though. Like, <laughs> okay. So I went home that night. And I could, like, it was turmoil. It was horrible. Like, the 
the tension was like the highest I've ever felt it. I was so uncomfortable. I laid in bed and I, I argued this for hours. Like, I do not believe. I'm not doing it. And so I'm laying there, laying in bed, laying in bed, and I just couldn't sleep. And finally, it was just like surrender. No. Okay, so I think I have to give up. I have to give this up because I couldn't sleep. I was so like, ugh, fighting, and it was uh, very uncomfortable. So I just thought, well, I mean, what's the worst that can happen? I guess I can just, I decided to believe. That's where it came from. I just like, I just, I'm just going to believe. I don't have any evidence. I don't have any reason to believe in God. But I got out of my bed, got on my knees, and I just said, I'm sorry. I, I think I do believe in you. And <laughs> I repeated the prayer from when I was in third grade. And I said, God, uh, forgive me. I want to know you. I want Jesus in my heart. Whatever I said back then, I said as much as I could remember. And the peace came to me. It was so beautiful. I still have it. God gave me that from maybe 17 years old. And now I've got a lot more I could say about like, oh, just not knowing God. I, I wish everybody in this room could know how I was like against it. And then God just totally changed me. And so that's where I'm going to stop. Amen. Thank you, God. You don't believe in me, though, remember? <laughs> just cracks me up. Thank you, Lisa, for sharing your story. Our next story comes from Grayson who talks about a time in his life when uh, God uh, made some changes in his life. Well, thank you uh, for, for letting me come up and speak. It's, it's wonderful to be with you. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure everybody has dreams, right? Yeah. You, you have an idea of what it is you're going to be and, and what, how things are going to work and, and everything that's going to be there. Um, from the smallest ever that I can remember, um, kindergarten, first grade, something like that, I thought I was going to be a teacher. I just knew I was going to be a teacher. Um, all of my teachers in grade school were incredible. My high school teachers, it was just, it was just really wonderful. So uh, I go off and I go to college and I become a teacher. And I am in about my sixth year of teaching. So I'm out of the honeymoon phase, you know. Uh, the kids kind of know who you are. The, um, the parents kind of recognize you. When you run into them at the supermarket, the kids are like, what are you doing here? Um, I thought you didn't leave the building, or like they wouldn't let you out, right? Um, so I'm in maybe my sixth year of teaching, uh, and the principal calls me down to his office. Um, I'm not the most well-liked teacher ever, because I give homework, um, and I, I expected a lot of my students uh, and I had a, a core group of kids that really responded to me. And then there were other kids that, that didn't. And that's just kind of the way it goes sometimes when you've got a job like teaching. Um, people can be fickle. So I get called down to the principal's office and I walk in and the superintendent of the small school system that I'm a part of um, and the principal are sitting there and they go, um, well, we wanted to talk to you today because we need you to give us your resignation. It, what? Um, ex excuse me, what's going on? Uh, we want you to give your, we need your two weeks notice. Um, so you're not firing me, but you want me to resign. Yeah, we need you to be out in two weeks. Um, and I'm like, what in the world is going on? Because I had never had any indication from the administration that there was any sort of a problem that there was anything that was um, not what it was supposed to be. And to get asked to resign in the middle of March, um, they're going to leave a classroom empty. <laughs> this is a big deal. Uh, and so I said, you've got it. That's, that's fine. You've got it. Uh, I march out to my car. They say, well, you can, you can go now. Come back tomorrow with your, your letter. Um, and you can, you can go. So it's maybe fifth period, something like that. Um, I'm teaching in this high school. Um, they said, oh, don't worry about it, we'll, we'll have your kids do some stuff and, and we'll go from there. Uh, and as I'm driving out the parking lot, I'm like, what is going on? How does this, how, what in the world is happening? Uh, and so I said to myself, I didn't do anything wrong. I mean, they didn't even tell me I did anything wrong. What, why am I getting 
fired. Uh, so I turned my car back around. I made a Michigan left before I knew what they were because I, <laughs> I, I'm not from Michigan. So um, I did that turn and I went back in and I said, I marched into the office and I still caught them. They were still both in, in my principal's office and I said, there's not a chance that I'm resigning. I'm just not gonna do it. Um, and so at that point, uh, I negotiated with the school. I uh, got some people that, that backed me up and some things like that. And so the school system said, okay, all right, you can finish out the year and, uh, and we'll see what happens. So I finished the year. At the end of the year, I go to my principal, I go to the superintendent, so what's up? Because um, you're going to fire me. I am not resigning. Uh, and they said, well, all right, well, if you do this performance improvement plan, uh, you can come back next year. And uh, if you do everything that's on it, um, you, can, you can stay. So I said, done, easy. I met with my principal every day, reworked the entire curriculum in the class that I was in, jumped through all of the hoops, um, and you knew a lawyer had looked at the thing because like the second page was all legalese. Like if the party of the second part, you know, it's just, <laughs> right, it was ridiculous. Um, I made sense of it, but I, and I jumped through the hoops. So it was going pretty well. The, f the first semester was, uh, was coming to a close. Uh, and part of my teaching was that kids had to do service hours. It was a school requirement, and my class was the one that they had to account for their hours. So I asked them to uh, turn in their paperwork. And this kid turned in a sheet with hours with a squiggle on the bottom. And I'm like, OK, <laughs> whose signature is that? It's my dad's. Really? You, you, um, everything is in the same color pen. Um, will you please have your dad give me a call? Let me know that you did your hours. Uh, the next thing I know, I'm in the principal's office with the superintendent and an angry mom. How dare you say that so-and-so didn't do their service hours? That's his father's signature. I'm just sitting there thinking, he doesn't know how to write his name. <laughs> and the principal's upset. Um, this is the first problem that er there had been all school year. And they fired me. They let me go. They said, you'll finish the school year and you can go. So I'm sitting in my classroom and a teacher comes in and says, hey, um, th this guy comes in, hey, I'm here for accreditation. Um, I need to watch your class. I'm like, I got nobody in here. Oh, that's all right. I, I'm, I'm not here to watch a class anyway. Um, we sat down and started talking. He was a principal at another school. So I said to him, hey, will you um, let me be a little forward? Do you wouldn't happen to need a teacher, would you? And he's like, yes, I do. I need a teacher. Um, I have to stop doing this, and so I need somebody to take my position. I said, I'm up for it. I'd love to do it. And we sat there and talked for 45 minutes, and I was basically hired at the end of that period. About halfway through that next school year, the, um, I'd given a couple chapel talks. I had worked in a Lutheran school, and they, um, I did a chapel, and his wife calls me in to her office. She was the school secretary and said, I had a dream about you last night. You need to go to seminary. And I said, you had a dream about me last night? That's weird. <laughs> So she's sitting over here, I'm standing at the bar, and I step back and I look into the office of the principal, and I say, what's going on with this dream thing? And he says, her dreams have always been right. You need to go to seminary. So we sat down, and 45 minutes later, I'm filling out an application to go to seminary. That was eight, uh, 10 years ago. Uh, I'm now the pastor at Trinity Lutheran Church down the road. Um, every, my entire life had been built to be a high school teacher. And God changed my story, the story I thought I was writing. He decided to do a rewrite and an edit, and I'm so thankful that he did. Thank you. Isn't that just how it goes sometimes, though? 45 minutes, God can change your whole life. Thank you, Grayson, for sharing your story. We're going to take a little break from the spoken um, stories right now, uh, listen to a little bit of music, and let those stories sort of uh, sink in. Um, and actually the music that we'll be listening to, this song was written by Dave Martin, who is our director of vocal music here at GIPC. And uh, this song is actually his God story. Um, so it'll be, it'll be nice to get a musical God story in here as well. But before we do that, um, we want 
you all to participate in this service. We want to hear from everyone, from all of you online in the chat. Um, at each God Talk Unfiltered event, we have uh, a prompt, sort of a uh, complete this sentence type of question that we ask everyone who's present, people who are sharing their stories and people who are, who are there just to listen, who aren't comfortable sharing their stories. And this little prompt, um, it's just a small way to listen to each other again, uh, to connect with each other. And so during this song and during the rest of the service, We'd like for you all to answer this prompt in the online chat uh, that you have here on YouTube, or if you're watching this on Facebook, uh, in the Facebook comments. And so your prompt today is, in this moment right now, I am most grateful for... So there's lots of different ways that you could fill that in. Um, for me right now, I'm grateful for uh, the ability to do retakes as I've messed up a bunch of these... <laughs> a bunch of these recordings so far. Um, but on a more serious note, I am incredibly, incredibly grateful for uh, for shelter from the cold. Um, I know not everyone has that, so I'm, I'm very grateful for that today because it's, uh, it's a cold one out there. So your answers can be anything. Uh, it's amazing to see how similar and different our, our answers are. So please uh, take some time to Answer, answer this prompt, share it in the in the chat. And you can share multiple times. It'd be great. How wonderful if we're grateful for multiple things in this moment. Now let's listen to Dave Martin's God story through song. the breath of the spirit but maybe it was the breeze or the rain or a voice inside my head i read the words of the four who walked and i've hearkened the thoughts of the prophet spend nights in conversation and contemplation on the meaning of love despite my faith i hold my fears i'm still not sure Like faithful fuel, I choose to read and walk with you. I think it's alright to admit I could be a fool. If so, I'm a fool who believes. That's cool with me. With the hunger and the need to know the answer and live my creed. Should walk in the dark be easy, or is the challenge some kind of test? Sometimes it seems it's only me who has to struggle with belief. They didn't have to work to get it, but shouldn't hope be more than a habit. Despite my faith, I hold my fears. I'm still not sure, but still I'm here. I choose to believe. My questions feed like faithful fuel. I choose to read and walk with you. I have to concede I could be a fool. Doubt is not my adversary, but my faithful friend. Always there to challenge me to decide where I stand. Won't you let me hear your voice? 
Thank you, Dave, for sharing your gifts and your story with us. And thank you, everyone online, for sharing um, your uh, responses to, to the prompt. It's, uh, I'm excited to look back and see all the, um, all the gratitude uh, that, that we have online. Um, our next story, I want to give you a little bit of a heads up on this one. Um, it's uh, from a woman named Rachel, and this is a sad one. I hope that you'll stick around to listen to it because it is beautiful, but it is a story of loss. And if you're just not ready for that right now, if you just need to take a break and maybe come back to this later, we completely understand and we wanted to give you that opportunity to do so. So if you need to take a break, go ahead and pause this and uh, jump back in uh, in about six or seven minutes or so, and uh, you can come back to it later. So let's listen to Rachel's story. Okay. Hmm. So 10 years ago, I was 23, and I was at this bar in Livonia where you had got drumsticks, and you bang sticks and get rowdy, and anyone who knows me knows I'm a grandma, so it was like 9.30, time to go. So I put my phone number on two of the sticks, and as I walked out, I just put it in two gentlemen's pockets and left. <laughs> Random. And the next morning, I got a phone call. Hi, right, this is David. I got your number on a drumstick. Do you want to meet for coffee? And this was before there was like Tinder and dating apps, so that was how you had to do it then. So, of course, <laughs> if you would ask for a beer, I probably would have said no, because that's my bedtime, beer time. So I met this guy at um, a little coffee shop, and we got coffee, and he was telling me about this bike trip he just got back from. It was uh, with an organization called Bike and Build. And he was all revved up about he biked 4,000 miles across the country for affordable housing and showing me pictures and you know, you should do this. You should sign up for this. And I was like, yeah, I should do this. I'm going to go home and sign up for this. So I had coffee with this nice guy, and I got home and looked up Bike and Build, paid $500 as my deposit, decided I was going to ride 4,000 miles across the country on a bicycle <laughs> for affordable housing because I was just going to graduate college, and why the heck not? So I then realized that my last bike had streamers, and I didn't know you wore spandex and shoes and a helmet. So <laughs> I had already get committed to the $500, so I was going to raise $4,000 and raise uh, money and awareness for affordable housing. I was going to ride eight, 80 miles plus a day across the country, build on houses. I've never played sports. I have no athletic ability. I had no proof that I could physically do this. So, of course, yes, I'm, I'm, sign me up. So <laughs> I went to the local bike shop and asked them if they would want to donate money. I was raising $4,000, and he asked me what kind of bike I had and if I needed a bike fit, and I was like, yeah, my bike fits, <laughs> you know. They send me a bike, and so it's a whole process. You have to, like, be measured, and you had to wear spandex, and so this nice guy gave me all of this gear that I didn't know I needed to ride across the country. I rode up there on the sidewalk, by the way, and I learned that road biking is in the road. <laughs> so I pledged I would ride 500 miles before we showed up. It was South Carolina to California, so I felt like I was on the real world. I had my one duffel bag and my bicycle. I had only rode 40 miles, but no one knew. And I was just going to fake it till I make it. And so <laughs> the first day, we're going up a mountain, and I live in Michigan, so there's gears on bicycles, which I didn't know. So I'm like, why is it so hard? And everyone's going like this in their little gear, and I'm just, like, trying to figure out how to do this. So um, I met this girl, Christina, on this bike trip, and she taught me all of the little tricks about, like, how to ride a bicycle. And every day was, like, 40 miles. This is my longest day. 75 miles. This is my longest day. Um, and quite frankly, thank God, I was actually really good at biking. Thank God. And so I had the best summer, just as David promised when I met in the bar, with the bike, you know, on the drumsticks, promised I would have the best summer ever. I had the best summer. I met my new best friend, Christina. We rode together. She taught me everything I needed to know about bicycling. So fast forward two years, Christina and I stayed in touch, best friends. She lived in Boston. We got together all the time. We both decided we were going to lead the next one. Now there's nine different routes that go across the country simultaneously. So we, we chose different routes because I was a school teacher and I couldn't get out as early as she could. So 
we both signed up to be a leader. There's four leaders per route, and you, you plan the route and what you're going to eat and where you're going to sleep and where you're going to shower. So we were in communion a lot because we had different routes going, yet we had the same role. So she had started a week before me, and we, had, we talked on the phone every day, and um, I had left her a message, just like any other day I would leave a message that said, hey, Christina, I know you're not answering because you're riding your bike across the country. Like, isn't that dangerous? Call me back. I'm driving home from work and I get a call from the program director and they said, are you sitting down? So I wasn't, so I sat down and I said, yeah, I'm sitting down. And they said, Christina was in an accident and she's not okay. I had just left her that message like 20 minutes before, probably at the time of her accident, actually. And so Christina got hit and she wasn't okay. She died. And that was my best friend. And now I have to ride 4,000 miles across the country and lead a group of 25 young adults that I don't know. And I have to tell their families when they drop them off that we're okay. We're going we're gonna to be safer. We're going to do better. So I went to her funeral. Literally the next day my ride started. So her funeral was in Boston and we left from New Hampshire that summer. I wanted to give up every day. Every day, I had to hold strong because I had literally 30 other people I was guiding across the country. And I wanted them to have the best summer because I had the best summer and I'd been promising them for months on our phone calls that it was gonna be the best. And so I delivered that. I got up every day and I biked every single mile for Christina. I biked every mile that she didn't get to bike. She was my tailwind. She got me through every mile. Every mile was so hard. And even now, I still, I'm so grateful for being Christina's friend, for her to be my best friend, because even now, eight years later, our friendship is a gift that keeps giving, because she's still a guiding force. She's still pushing every mile for me. Thank you. Really beautiful. Thank you, Rachel, for sharing your story. Uh, Rachel's shared a few times at God Talk Unfiltered and her stories are always just so beautiful. So thank you, Rachel. Next up, we have Barry. So let's listen to his story. So if I've told you this before and I forgot, it's just because I'm old and the stuff I'm gonna tell you about happened when table A over here was all in diapers, so. Um, <laughs> I apologize, go to the bathroom if I told you before. But anyway, Don and I uh, moved to California uh, right after college. We didn't know anybody. We decided to plan for our wedding for two years. And about five months before we got married, I lost my job and spent about three months working as a quasi-paid mechanic in a French shop while I searched for a job. I'm a lawyer, so it was kind of a blow. And then I got another job. Three weeks later, we got married. About six, seven months later, she announced that we're having a baby. It wasn't really what we intended. Our plan was uh, pay off our student loans, buy a house, which in California is <laughs> crazy, um, and, and pay all our debt off and, and get ready to have a kid, grow up, stop partying all the time. None of those things happened. Bam, we're having a kid. So she went in and, and we went through the various tests and she had an ultrasound and we got a little picture that looked like a Rorschach blob and they said that blob's the head and that blob's the butt and then I said, oh no, that's the head. And I took it around and showed all my friends and then she had some tests called like alpha beta protein, the grocery store test, and they said, yeah, this is bad. Um, it's way, way too high. So they said, we need more tests. So they did more tests and they said, okay, you need to come in for genetic counseling. And we didn't know what that was, so we went in, and it started with the doctor sitting down with us and saying, I'd like to pray with you. Can I pray with you? Well, when your doctor says, hey, let's pray, that's not what you want to hear. <laughs> that means, you know, I don't have any options for you. This is, this is going to be bad. We've learned that since then. We didn't know at the time. And he goes into a prayer, and he talks about, you know, comforting this couple and helping them see that out of tragedy can come great things at times. 
So then we went through genetic counseling and they said, well, your baby probably has, uh, I think it was called spinal bifida, but I could be wrong, which means there's a hole in your baby, either in the spine or in the brain. And they said, as high as your tests are, that hole's gonna be big. Your baby may, may not have a brain. And they said, then they stopped and they said, well, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go in and we're gonna do a super duper, super ultrasound. And we're gonna look at every inch of your baby and we're gonna tell you where the hole is and how big it is and figure out, you know, maybe something can be done. They wouldn't let me go in. So Donna goes in and the lady starts doing the blobs and looking at the screen and all of a sudden she gasps and she says, and my wife says, what? And she says, we gotta get your husband in here. So she runs out and gets me, Mr. Jensen, get in here right now. So I go in and Donna's just sobbing, just absolutely, she doesn't know what's going on, she's sobbing. And I said, well, you know, what, what's going on? You know, what's so horrible? And she says, well, we got two heads. I'm like, oh, National Enquirer, we're gonna have a two-headed baby. <laughs> I said, well, are there at least two bodies? I'm thinking maybe it's the joint twins, they can cut them apart or something. And she goes, no, dummy, it's twins. <laughs> and it turns out just by chance, when they did the ultrasound, the babies were right on top of each other and they could not see two babies. And when they did the heartbeat thing, their hearts, because they're identical, I guess they were perfectly in sync. So they couldn't tell that there were two hearts. And we went from um, having a dead baby to having twins, which was pretty neat. And I think the doctor's prayers were. <laughs> I think the doctor's prayers were answered in that we learned that out of tragedy can come a great thing. Gotta love Barry. <laughs> Barry sees God everywhere and uh, also finds the, the humor in things. Thank you, Barry, for sharing your story today. Um, our next story is actually our final story of the service. Um, and this story comes from Leah. And she tells us about a humorous uh, yet profound point in her life when she discovered the power of prayer. Can y'all hear me? Okay. Um, let's see. My God story happened on the side of a mountain when I was 14 years old. My family lived in Nashville, Tennessee, and we belonged to a big Presbyterian church. And every year, the youth group would go on this retreat and hike up Mount LeConte, which is the third highest peak in uh, the Smoky Mountains. Okay? This is the, the biggest thing that the youth group does all year, and I was 14, and I was getting to go. The way the trip went, you hiked for two days. You go up the mountain and you stay on the top. There's a lodge and some uh, cabins. You spend the night and the next day you hike back down. Fabulous. Uh, to prepare for this trip, you needed good hiking shoes and you needed to stay on the trail. This was very important. You had to stay on the trail. Got off the trail, you got lost. Okay? So, very excited. My parents didn't have enough money to buy me any uh, hiking boots, so I wore my school shoes, and um, they they were they looked pretty good. I mean, they were they were uh, lace up leather, you know. Anyway, so we uh, started up the mountain, and it was long, 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 long. It took us eight hours to get to the top, but it's okay. It's the beginning. Everybody's happy. We got lots of energy. I uh, saw lots of bears, got chased by a bear. It was very exciting. Okay, so we get up to the top, get our assignments in our cabins, and we go to sleep. Next morning, we're going to go down the mountain. I get up and put on my shoes, and they will not go on my feet. My feet have swollen up because I have bad shoes, and I've been hiking for eight hours the day before. To make matters worse, the night before at the bonfire, my feet were a little chilly, and I got them too close to the fire, so I caught my toes on fire. I did. And, no, I did. <laughs> and so the tip of my shoe had melted. And so not only do I have swollen feet, but my shoes are about a size too small, okay? 
All right, but the only way to get up and down this mountain is to walk. Uh, there's no motorized trail. Uh, they do have, uh, they have mules that take the uh, supplies to the top, but otherwise everybody has to walk, so I gotta walk. All right, but, oh, the bright spot is it's only four hours down. We're taking a different trail down, so don't have to do it for eight hours. Four hours, a little steeper, but I can do four hours, right? All right, so um, start hiking down. I can only go five minutes, and then I got to sit down. Everybody gets further and further ahead of me, except for one girl. One girl stayed with me. To tell you how self-involved, I do not remember her name. <laughs> she stayed with me the whole time, and I do not remember her name. It might have been Julie. I, I really don't know. So, anyway... <laughs> She stayed with me, but the rest of the group got ahead of us. But we hike, we hike, we rest, we rest. And after about four hours, we say, hmm, you know, they told us it was only going to take us about four hours. Now, we've been resting a lot, so it may take us a little bit longer, but we should be coming to the end now. And then it dawns on us. We haven't seen anybody on this trail the whole time. Usually when you're hiking up and down, you know, people are hiking up as you're hiking down, and you say, hey, how long till the end? And you can kind of track your progress. Oops. We hadn't seen anybody. So, obviously, we were on the wrong trail, right? And so we started crying and crying and crying. And this is about prayer. You, you stole my thunder. Um, I started praying. Up until this time, the only prayers I ever said were over my meals and now I lay me down to sleep when I would go to bed. But I depended on my parents to do my praying for me, but they weren't there. So I had to pray myself. And I prayed all the way down. I prayed to get to the bottom. I prayed that I wouldn't get attacked by a bear. I, I, I prayed that I would be rescued. I prayed I'd see my family again. Um, obviously, I made it, right? <laughs> I'd like to tell you that when I started praying, all of a sudden, I had this warm, fuzzy feeling. I said, oh, it's going to be okay. I did not feel that way. I cried and cried. Me and Nameless Girl, man, we <laughs> cried all the way down the mountain. <laughs> so, and I'd like to tell you that when the park rangers rescued me, I went down on my knees and said, thank you, Lord. I did not do that either. God was but a distant memory by that time, and I needed to take off my shoes. But anyway, I, I prayed, and I talked to God. And do I think that I was rescued because I prayed? Or do I think that if I hadn't prayed, a bear would have eaten me up? I don't think so. God was with me that whole time. God didn't need me to tell him what to do. <laughs> Obviously, he had it together. But I learned that I could talk to God, that I didn't need my mom and daddy to say my prayers for me, and uh, that I could talk to him and that he would listen. Thank you. Camping is always an adventure, right? <laughs> uh, thank you, Leah, for sharing your story. And thank all of you uh, for taking this time to listen uh, to all these stories and to share um, those things for which you're grateful in the online chat um, and for just spending this time together and spending this time uh, with God. Today, I, I feel like we've really engaged in something important, uh, and something, something big. Um, in a world where there is so much talking and so much noise, I guess just noise, there's so much noise out there. Um, today, we took time to just sit and listen. So I thank you all for being a part of it. And uh, let's just remember that uh, speaking is brave, but listening is sacred.
our faith in Jesus Christ, God comes to each of us and takes the events of our lives and turns them into a story, a narrative, and then takes this narrative and fits it into the larger story of what God is doing in the world. Our imaginations are narratively based. That's why we like movies and television shows and even athletic events who are really a story, beginning, middle, and an end, and a plot and tension that's resolved. We love stories. God made people because God loves stories, and it is sacred to listen to them. This week, listen to the various stories that God brings to you, and in them, hear the story of God the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. These blessings are with you now, and they always are. Amen and amen.